Hello, party people, and welcome to Office Hours in Telluride, Colorado. Uh, took a road trip over here from Vegas. It's about a 10-hour drive altogether. The way that I drive, I don't go very well anywhere in a hurry. And what a beautiful day. So I thought, hey, let's whip out the camera. And I'm actually shooting this in Apple's uh, spatial video. I'll put in the show notes a link if you have either an Oculus Quest uh, or if you have one of the new Apple Vision Pros uh, so that you can see what it looks like in glorious 3D. So let's see what your top voted questions are. Number one top voted question is from Artyom who asks, Hi Brent, we currently have a huge corporate data warehouse, 100 plus databases, 50 terabytes in size mainly analytical workload. We're having problems with latches in TempDB. Any advice on what to try? Yes, and I really hate opening the show with this kind of answer, but that's why I recorded a class, Fundamentals of TempDB. I have a whole class explaining to you, and I said it's a one day long class, it's only like 90 bucks, which is pennies compared to how much that data warehouse is costing you teaches you what uses TempDB, how it causes you performance problems, how to figure out which one of those you're suffering from, like what's creating the latching problems, and several different ways that you can fix it. So if you go to brentozar.com, click training up at the top, believe it or not, people actually buy my training classes. That's how I can afford to go to places like this. Next up we have, my tea got cold says, how can I test something under the same load as production? My test server is identical, but I don't know how to get it. I, I get it identical workloads. Oh, this is really hard. And if you Google for Brentos our uh, uh, load testing, you'll see a bunch of articles that I've written out there about why it's so hard. But I'm going to give you the simplest example, a delete. You can only load test a delete statement once. If you try to run the same delete again, that data will already be deleted. Your workload probably has all kinds of inserts, updates, and deletes. So when you're doing a workload test, you really have to capture a workload. Then you have to restore the database to the exact moment that the workload started and then replay it with the tool in the exact same order, restoring the database to the point in time every single time that you do one of these tests. That's a giant pain in the rear. I'll give you the next harder example. Your developers are continuously adding new features to their application. They're adding new screens, they're adding new app calls, and you don't know how to run those until it's too late. You don't know how to run those because, of course, you weren't involved in the design process. You weren't involved in uh, uh, building out a whole test harness to call it the right proportion of times. So that's why what you really don't want to do is you don't want to load test the database server. You want to load test the entire application front to back. You want to have people throw load against the application which will then stress test your web servers, your middle tier services, and your database server. I'll give you one final example about why it's so hard. I worked with a client who worked so hard to get the, their load tests abs for the database absolutely perfect. They were so confident that things were going to go great. And then when they shipped the, the code changes live, the database server fell over because they didn't have the right mix of queries that were going to be run. They had spent all this time performance tuning stored procedures that were never called, and then they didn't tune the stored procedures that ended up getting called on every web page load. So that's why you really want to load test from the application side. Next up, QEnt says, Hello, Brent. I see that most of the advice out there uh, around SQL Server performance tuning focuses on select queries and not DML queries. Is this because they follow the same logic, or is it because we don't have a chance for better performance? Generally, when you're doing inserts, updates, and deletes, you're only doing a limited number of them at a time. 
and I don't, you could be doing 10,000 of them at a time. When you do an insert, update, or delete, you're generally only inserting, updating, or deleting a relatively small number of rows with that statement. Whereas with selects, you're often controlling huge amounts of data and then bringing back large amounts of data. So they tend to be much harder to tune. Usually data professionals have much less requests to tune inserts, updates, and deletes. And usually tuning inserts, updates, and deletes boils down to two things. Making sure that you don't have too many indexes, foreign keys, triggers that are affected whenever you do an insert, update, or delete. Uh, and then two is tuning blocking, uh, because if you have a large number of updates trying to grab the same row at the same time, you can run into problems with that. We talk about those in my Mastering Query Tuning class. Next up, let's see here. Tom in York says, have you ever seen Query Store and Optimize for Ad Hoc cause an extreme increase in log growth? No, me personally, no. He says, using Aaron Stilato's suggested defaults for query store settings, I saw log sizes grow up to 2,000% and backups take 200 times longer, and now I'm trying to figure out how to use FM dump DB log. Generally, if you have a workload that is extremely heavy on ad hoc statements, one-off statements, uh, unparameterized T-SQL, entity framework with in statements, Query Store, I'm going to say something controversial, Query Store doesn't really help you that much because Query Store is only focused on monitoring the other queries. So if you only monitor a subset of your workload, you're often missing the queries that are really causing the problem. I can't tell you how many performance tuning gigs I've been brought into where somebody was like, I looked at the top resource using queries in my monitoring tool. I've been tuning the daylights out of them. Things aren't getting better. And then we go pop open the hood and they have a huge number of unparameterized queries that are stabbing the server to death. That was a stabbing motion, not something else. Uh, so I, I would say if you have a big unparameterized query workload, query store isn't the, the answer that you're looking for to begin with. Chomping Bits says, my friend has a six terabyte data warehouse running Ola's scripts on indexes and st stats weekly on Saturdays. They run, uh, <laughs> they run on Saturday and then they run till Wednesday or Thursday. Any advice to speed up processing? If you search for Brent Ozar fragmentation, you'll find out why usually you're just shuffling deck chairs on the Titanic. All you're doing is making more work for yourself and you're not actually solving performance problems. So search for Brent Ozar fragmentation and that'll open up a whole new world. Then you're going to be like, well, Brent, I still have to update statistics. Yes. Then go search for Brent Ozar statistics. And what you'll find out is that a lot of the stats you've been updating really don't need to be updated. Now, I'll give you an example. Let's say that you, in your data warehouse, in your fact sales table, you have sales by product ID. Do you really need to update those, update those every week? Do your product IDs change every week? Oh my God, there's this brand new product and we've never seen it before and it's all of our sales. No. Not when your data warehouse spans years worth of history, the data isn't changing that significantly over time. So why are you updating all of the stats every week when the end result is the data really isn't changing all that much? I'm not saying you never need to update stats. By all means, there may be some stats that you actually do have to update on a regular basis. Sales by sales date is a classic example for that, but that's where you only pick out the stats that you need to update, not trying to do the shotgun express, uh, ex, uh, approach of, let's go update them all again, it's Saturday, Bubba, let's do this, because it, it just doesn't scale. And then let's see here, next up we have, oh, Rollback is Single Threaded asks, Hi, Brent. Does disabling lock escalation on a table reduce blocking? So in theory, yes, but it causes you a brand new problem. 
Because then if you disable lock escalation, SQL Server has to tra track locking on a row by row basis. If you're doing so much uh, lock escalation, that means you're probably lots of statements are grabbing more than 4,000 rows at a time. If you're having that problem, you're going to run into memory issues because SQL Server is going to burn up a ton of memory to track those locks. I have seen out in production systems where people disabled lock escalation and the server ground to a halt because all of its memory was used to track locks. It's also really hard to troubleshoot because most tools out there aren't designed to look for this problem. What you can do if you're already facing, if you decided to disable lock escalation, is go to look at your memory clerk's DMV and start tracking how much of your memory is being used to, to, use, uh, to track locks. Uh, next up, Sophie says, what is your opinion of the Microsoft Fabric certification? Is it worth it? If you're trying to get a job managing fabric, sure. If you're not, probably not. Fabric's one of those technologies that's changing rapid fire. There aren't really good best practices out there about it. So in my opinion, the fabric certification is really all more about proving that you can pass a test. It's less about uh, knowing best practices, real world stuff. Next up, uh, Frost says, have you ever conducted a daily stand-up for production DBAs? I feel like my new manager wants me to micromanage my team, but we're already functioning automatically and we're not sure what the purpose of this is. Yes. Okay, so what's useful for um, what stand-ups is if someone's hitting a block, if someone's just, you notice that someone's been working on something for two or three days, they may not have the experience necessary and it helps everyone surface that quickly so that another team member can say, oh, it looks like you're struggling with this. Let me jump in and help. That to me is what stand-ups are more useful for is making sure, because a lot of times in, in groups, people are like, oh, I'm doing the same thing today. Yeah, me too. You want to get more specific about what is it that's taking you a while? Because maybe people are banging their heads against something manually that they really should be automating, for example. And then we'll do one more. Rom says, what is your opinion of optimized locking in Azure SQL DB? Will we see this feature flow down to boxed SQL? So I haven't worked with it at all because I haven't had a client facing locking problems in Azure SQL DB since that was announced. Now, one way that you could read into that is you could say, well, Brent, that sounds like it's solving the problem. It totally could be. I wouldn't be surprised if it is. It's really cool that Microsoft is doing some R&D around locking, especially since that topic hasn't changed in like 24 years. That's not true. It changed in SQL Server 2005. Um, uh, so I, I, I have no reason to think it's bad. I also have no reason to look at it. So I don't really have much to, to say around that. Will it flow into boxed SQL? Well, it is 2024 and we still don't have a feature complete SQL Server 2022. Microsoft is still finishing SQL Server 2022. So because of that, I, I'm not really that worried about whatever the next version of SQL Server is. I think Microsoft has a problem if they trot out a brand new version when they haven't even fixed the problems that 2022 has yet. They might do it. It wouldn't be unheard of for Microsoft to do something like that. Brand new SQL Server 2025. It fixes what we said you'd have three years ago. Don't look at the behind the curtain. Um, I, from everything that I see about Azure, Azure's optimized locking, you know, of course, I'm making a lot of fun here, uh, but I have no reason to expect that that wouldn't be in SQL Server's box products someday. At the same time, there are still features in each of those products that haven't made it across to the other. I don't think Azure SQL DB still has CLR yet. They ripped that out of Azure SQL DB like four or five years ago. Um, there's other prop, pro, or things that isn't inside there. I want to say, I might be wrong about it, but inline functions took like two or three years to get from one side to the other, from SQL Server Box product up to Azure SQL DB. 
Um, there was something else that shipped in 2019 or 2022 and still hasn't, I can't remember if it was a memory optimized TempDB perhaps, in memory OLTP optimizations for TempDB hasn't made it into Azure SQL DB yet. So I know for a while, Microsoft let used to say that they're the same products, it's just the ones in the cloud, and ones on on-premise. But I think we've kind of seen through that these days that they really are two separate feature sets across uh, each of them. So maybe it comes to the box product, maybe it doesn't ever. All right, well, there we go. There's a good little set of questions there. I am now, let's see, it's about uh, two o'clock in the afternoon. Plans for today. I believe Eve is getting ready to go in the hot tub. There's a really cool hot tub here on the property. We're here for a week. Uh, got some friends of ours flying in in a couple of days, and we'll uh, tell you right. It's fantastic. I love tell you right. This is my first time being here in the winter. I've uh, been here in the summer a few times before. It's just absolutely gorgeous. It's in the middle of nowhere in Colorado. You kind of have to want to get here. Um, which also makes it really charming. Spectacular skiing. I don't ski at all. Um, spectacular skiing, though. And so as a result, because you kind of have to want to be here and it's spectacular skiing, it's this really cool laid back, lots of skiing, uh, celebrities. Uh, Tom Cruise had a house here for the longest time. Oprah Winfrey has a house here. Um, and uh, rest restaurants are just fantastic. A lot of really good restaurants here. It's surprising given how small the uh, town is. So, uh, so I think this afternoon, Eve's getting in the hot tub. I'm going to play with the Apple Vision Pro uh, here for a while, and then we'll go down into town and uh, grab some food. So I will see y'all on the next Office Hours. Adios, y'all.